This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether it's your new profession or just a lifelong passion, start your journey to website glory with Squarespace. Check out their amazing all-in-one platform through the link in the description below. More on them in just a bit. In a forgotten corner, in one of Europe's most obscure states, lies an unrecognized micronation frozen in time. At the moment the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, the reaction across its former republics was broadly one of joy. Peoples that had spent decades suffering under Moscow's boot were suddenly in charge of their own destinies, from Estonia to Ukraine to Kazakhstan. The air was filled with excitement for the future. But not everywhere. On the eastern bank of the Dniester River in newly independent Moldova, the demise of the USSR was not something to celebrate, but something to be stopped at all costs. Terrified of being annexed into neighboring Romania, the citizens of Transnistria declared independence, determined to freeze their homestead in a rapidly vanishing Soviet past. Three decades later, they're still there. Today, a de facto independent state within Moldova, Transnistria remains time-locked in an era of Lenin statues, communist flags, and unabashed nostalgia for the USSR. Unrecognized by the wider world, it exists almost as a living fossil with dramatic repercussions for all of its citizens. Today on Geographics, we're examining how, in one tiny state, the Soviet Union never truly died. If you open up an atlas and go hunting with a magnifying glass, you'll eventually locate a tiny country called Moldova. One of Europe's smallest, poorest, and least known nations, Moldova sits between Romania and Ukraine, a Maryland-sized strip of rolling hills bisected by the Dniester River. Yet, no matter how hard you search, there's a micronation there you'll never find. Known as Transnistria, or Transdenistria, or officially the Pridnistrovskaya Moldavskaya Republic, apologies for my pronunciation, this tiny state has its own flag, its own currency, and issues its own passports. It has a government, elections, control of its borders, in short, all the trappings of a functional state, with one exception. Not a single other nation on earth recognizes its existence. Only three other contested states officially acknowledge Transnistria. South Ossetia, Abkhazia, and Nagorno-Karabakh, themselves only partly recognized. Yet lacking a spot at the UN table hasn't stopped Transnistria from developing its own unique and uniquely strange identity. Sprawling along the east bank of the Dniester, it covers a mere 3,500 square kilometers on par with Rhode Island. Unlike Rhode Island, though, its shape is patently absurd. 400 kilometers long, with an average width of a little more than 25 kilometers. In other words, it's like a pint-sized chili, albeit one with a population far less into ceviche and way more into borscht. Speaking of the population, they're a pretty mixed bunch, divided about equally between ethnic Russians, Ukrainians, and Moldovans. But of course, it's not demographics that most people are interested in when it comes to Transnistria. Let's be honest, no one clicked on this video to hear about the economic situation, about how wages are lower than in Moldova, already one of Europe's poorest nations. Nor did they want to hear about the brain drain problem, which has seen about a third of the population move abroad since the collapse of communism. No. The thing that really fascinates most of us about Transnistria, the reason why we made this video, and probably why you clicked on it, can be summed up in three simple words. Retro communist shit. Walk through the capital, Tiraspol, and you'll find streets named after communist icons or significant dates in the Soviet calendar. Along these same time-warped streets, statues of Lenin still stand, luring the workers of the world into his socialist gingerbread house. The state flag, too, is a Marxist's bedroom ceiling fantasy adorned with a hammer and sickle, the only flag on earth to still retain the symbol. But perhaps the most significant throwback is the sheer number of Russian soldiers. Since 1992, Transnistria has played host to anywhere between 1,200 and 2,000 Russian army regulars charged with keeping the peace. And it's here that we can see how this microscopic state has managed to maintain de facto independence for so long. As in the height of the Cold War, most of the money keeping Tiraspol afloat 
comes from Moscow. It's Russia that builds the regions, hospitals, and schools, that pays old age pensions, that keeps the power flowing, even if the money today comes not from the Politburo, but from Putin's spare change. All of which may lead you to wonder, well, why? Why is Russia committed to supporting an unrecognized nation trapped in the past like a mosquito fossilized in amber? To answer that, we're going to have to delve into the region's history. A history of division, domination, and political strife, all pointing in one unavoidable direction towards war. Although it might seem obscure now, the strip of land today occupied by Moldova, Transnistria, and the scrap of Ukraine west of Odessa was once one of Europe's hotspots. Historically known as Bessarabia, it spent centuries as an outer province of the Ottoman Empire before finally being taken by Russia in 1812. But while the Treaty of Bucharest would definitively end Islamic influence on the region, it would also open up a whole new cultural tug of war. Across the century, this new province of the Russian Empire swung between periods of semi-autonomy and complete repression. In some decades, Moldovans might be placed in charge of their own affairs, in others ethnic Russians would be calling the shots. While this bred resentment, for a long time there wasn't much anyone could do about it. Lacking an alternative, residents of Bessarabia were basically stuck with the Tsar. Until the Kingdom of Romania was born. Made from the joining of Wallachia and Moldavia, the kingdom rose from the ashes of the Russo-Turkish War. For many in Bessarabia, this was fantastic news. Moldovans and Romanians are so ethnically and culturally close that it's the point of contention today whether they're actually separate peoples or not. While we don't personally want to wade into such a charged debate, the point is that a hell of a lot of Moldovans within the Russian Empire saw the rise of Romania as a source of hope, a kingdom run by their kingfolk rather than some bow-whiskered Russian despot. This stirring nationalism was helped by the fact that Bessarabia had once been part of Moldavia. Rejoining the two seemed like an eminently achievable goal, provided, that is, the Russians could bear being ejected. Fortunately, a planet-wide calamity was about to do just that. Initially, the arrival of World War I seemed unlikely to change anything in Bessarabia. From 1916, Romania and Russia found themselves fighting on the same side, meaning a post-war Romanian land grab was out of the question. Then 1917 dawned, and the calculation changed completely. In the wake of the February Revolution that toppled the Russian Tsar, the Moldovians in Bessarabia joined together in demanding autonomy and the right to use the Romanian language. When the Bolshevik October Revolution hit just eight months later, Later, they went even further, establishing a council known as Safat to declare Bessarabia an autonomous republic. When the Bolsheviks were all like, nah, no thanks, we'd rather keep you as our personal b****s, the Safat went running to Romania, and Big Brother was only too glad to help. February 1918 saw the Romanian army sweep through Bessarabia, scattering Bolshevik forces like a hungry cat, a flock of pigeons. By the 6th, the Safat was able to proclaim an independent republic. Just two months later, that republic voted overwhelmingly to unite with Romania. But there was a tiny problem. The Romanians hadn't been able to liberate all of Bessarabia. The Bolsheviks had managed to hold the slither of land across the Nyster, a region then home to around 400,000 ethnic Moldavians. As the larger Western Bank was absorbed into Romania's kingdom, the East Bank was officially made an autonomous region within the Ukrainian SSR. Known as the Moldovan Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic, it stood roughly where Transnistria stands today, a slice of Bessarabia separated from its sibling by a river border. Home not just to Moldovans, but also a growing number of ethnic Ukrainians and Russians. And it would take another planet-wide catastrophe to finally rejoin them. Now we'll get back to today's video in just a second, but first, here's a quick word from today's sponsor, Squarespace. Now there are two things to keep in mind here. Maybe you've got some idea for a website or a business, YouTube channel, podcast, something like that knocking around in your mind. Well, second thing is, the only way to figure out whether that's worth doing is to get it out there into the world, and obviously that can be daunting because it's scary to go and pursue new things, but while not knowing how to set up a website is not an excuse. There are no excuses available with Squarespace. Squarespace allows you to create a powerful website for whatever you're up to. Want to sell something online? Yes, easy to set up a store with Squarespace. 
podcast? Sure. Starting a YouTube channel? Well, you definitely want a website to complement it. It all starts on Squarespace with a beautiful template that you can customize to your heart's content. Or you can start from scratch or easily move over an existing domain, making everything super easy to manage. Don't start from scratch, though. Just use a template. It's easier. Like I say, no excuses. And once you've gone through the super easy customization process, there are no updates, no patches, no tech BS to deal with. And Squarespace also handles all the website-y stuff. Podcasts, yes, mailing lists, of course, social integrations, and so much more. Like I say, Squarespace removes the excuses to your dreams. Also, 24-7 customer support who help you whenever you've got a question. So head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash geographics to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And now back to today's video. In August 1939, Molotov and Ribbentrop sat down to sign a non-aggression pact between Nazi Germany and the USSR. By now, Bessarabia had been split for over 20 years, the western part suffering chronic underinvestment by the Romanian authorities, the eastern part a mere speck on the far edge of the Ukrainian SSR. But Joseph Stalin was determined to change all that. Now officially at peace with Germany, Stalin waited until France had been conquered and Britain forced into retreat at Dunkirk before making his move. On June 28, 1940, Soviet troops marched across the Nystad River, sending Romanian forces running in their wake. Remember that analogy about the Bolsheviks scattering before the Romanian army like pigeons before a hungry cat? Well, those pigeons had gone and hit the gym, grabbed some guns, and were now storming back decked out in shades and declaring, I'm here to kick some kitty cat ass and chew bubble gum. And I'm all out of bubble gum. In less than two weeks, the Red Army had annexed Bessarabia, reorganizing it into the Moldovan Soviet Socialist Republic. Although the slice of land skirting the Black Sea went to Ukraine, the Moldovan SSR was now a constituent republic in its own right, the second smallest in the entire USSR. But there would be one last back and forth before this cycle of conquest and counter-conquest ended. July 1941 saw Romania's last gasp attempt to hold on to its former province. Backed by Nazi Germany, they seized the entire Moldovan SSR, including the east bank of the Nystad. They then embarked on a killing spree, massacring any Jews who didn't flee to Ukraine and trying to ethnically cleanse the territory of Ukrainians and Russians. The violence lasted right up until 1944, when the Soviets again reconquered Bessarabia. And this time, it would be Romania's allies who suffered. Although 1944 marked the end of the fighting over Bessarabia, that fighting had by now left deep scars. Those west of the Nystad saw the Soviets as an occupying force, one which had annexed them from their rightful home in Romania. Those in the east, on the other hand, saw the pro-Romania faction as traitors who'd joined with a Nazi-supporting state to oppress and kill them. This is the division that would lie at the heart of the split between Moldova and Transnistria. One that, unlike many other post-Soviet conflicts, wasn't based solely on ethnicity. And some four decades after World War II ended, it would re-emerge to fracture society. By the mid-1980s, the Moldovan SSR seemed a fact of life. A place as dully, dutifully Soviet as anywhere in the empire. But then Mikhail Gorbachev instituted the USSR's new policy of glasnost, or openness, and everything changed. Suddenly, political thoughts and acts were no longer policed. Across the Soviet Union, these new freedoms gave birth to national aspirations. But while the new nationalist movements would mostly lead to peaceful protests and eventual freedom from the bloc, in a handful of SSRs, they would quickly turn poisonous. In Moldova, resurgent pro-Romanian feeling began to bubble back, infecting the highest levels of society. By 1989, even the SSR Supreme Soviet was in on the act, changing the official language from Russian to Moldovan, a tongue so close to Romanian, some argue that they're not really separate. At the same time, Moldovian Romanian was made the national identity, a move which made the Russians and Ukrainians in Transnistria increasingly nervous. Still, Romania at this stage was still ruled by a mad tyrant. So long as Nicolae Ceausescu was still in charge there, driving his countrymen ever deeper into poverty and malnutrition, these pro-Romanian changes would only ever be symbolic. But that seemingly comforting thought invited a deeper question. What would happen when Ceausescu was no longer around? Unfortunately for those in Transnistria, they were about to find out. On Christmas Day 1989, the world watched in shock as Nicolae Ceausescu, freshly overthrown in a revolution, was executed on TV. It was one of the definitive moments in the fall of communism in Eastern Europe, a signal that the world was about to change. 
For Moldova, that change would soon destabilize everything. In the wake of the Romanian Revolution, the new government threw open the borders with Moldova. In return, the Moldovan SSR ditched its socialist character. It adopted the Romanian flag, made the Romanian anthem into Moldova's official song. From the point of view of those making the changes, they were simply writing a historic mistake. Before the Russian Empire came along, the Romanian Kingdom of Moldavia had included Bessarabia. As far as the cheerleaders of this brave new world were concerned, their interwar union with Romania had been a return to the status quo. It was the years of separation under communism that were its aberration. But that's not how those in Transnistria saw it. With a longer history with the USSR, the two-thirds Slavic population across the Dniester could see nothing but extinction awaiting them, an eternity as a persecuted minority in some greater Romania. Nor were they the only ones. In August of 1990, the Gagaus people in South Moldova, a Turkic-speaking minority, declared independence from the Moldovan state. Although Chisinau mustered a militia to stop them, Soviet troops still based in the country forced the militia to stand down. In doing so, they gave Transnistria's leaders the green light they needed. On September 2, 1990, the independent Pridnestrovian Moldavian Soviet Socialist Republic was declared in Tiraspol. Although Gorbachev made a counter-declaration from Moscow, voiding the split, on the grounds it made no difference. That November, the Moldovan army tried to cross the Nystra into the Transnistrian town of Dubasari, only to be blocked by locals swarming the bridge. Two were killed in the fighting, the first deaths in what would soon become the Transnistria War. But while violence didn't properly explode just yet, greater events would soon push both sides over the brink. In August of 1991, communist hardliners tried to depose Gorbachev in a coup. Although they failed, the attempt triggered a stampede for the exit as former SSR after former SSR declared themselves independent from the Soviet Union. On August the 27th, Moldova followed suit, but rather than consult the Transnistrians and Gagas people, Chisinau simply declared them a part of the new Moldovan state. It was the beginning of a long march towards violence. By early 1992, it was clear that war was coming. Transnistria was still blocking Moldovan forces from entering. Its leaders were demanding either complete independence or continued union with Russia. Nor were they the only ones. In former republics of the Soviet Union, most notably Georgia and Azerbaijan, separatist movements and once autonomous regions were trying to split away from their new national masters. Finally, on March 2, 1992, the situation along the Dniester ignited. On the Moldovan side, police units joined with volunteer paramilitaries to create a fighting force of 25,000 supplied with additional equipment and weapons from Romania. In Transnistria, 9,000 volunteers joined forces with far-right Ukrainian paramilitaries to try and beat them back. There were major battles at pretty much every bridge across the river. The Transnistrian town of Benderi saw a successful invasion with tanks exchanging fire in the streets. At one point, Moldova even scrambled MiG-29s to bomb river crossing points. But in the end, it was only the actions of a single player that really mattered. Russia. Still stationed in the region from the days of the USSR, the newly independent Russian 14th Army came down on the side of Transnistria. Supplying 14,000 troops, they turned the tide of the battle, forcing Chisinau to give up the conquest. On July 21, 1992, a ceasefire was finally declared. As part of the agreement, a permanent Russian peacekeeping force was installed along the Dniester, effectively creating a new, unrecognized border between Transnistria and Moldova proper. There would be some good-faith attempts to end the stalemate over the coming years. In 1994, for example, Chisinau would kill plans to reunite with Romania and rewrite the Moldovan constitution to give significant autonomy to both Transnistria and the Gagos Republic. But while this would be enough to bring the Gagaus people back into Moldova, Transnistria would forever remain out of reach. From now on, the old region of Bessarabia would be home to two states, one with a seat at the UN and its name displayed on maps, and one completely unrecognized. The years following the Transnistrian War saw infrequent flare-ups along the banks of the Dniester. In 2005, for example, Transnistria cut off power to the rest of Moldova during a diplomatic spat. A year later, the region voted to join the Russian Federation, a request Moscow politely declined. On the other side of the river, Romania stirred up trouble in 2007 by offering to hand out passports to any Moldovan who wanted one, a move Transnistrians saw as a prelude to annexation. By the late 2000s, though, the situation had mostly settled into an unlikely calm. While other post-Soviet frozen conflicts had a nasty habit of occasionally getting hot, fighting never really returned to Transnistria. Indeed, fast forward to the here and now, and relations between Moldova and its breakaway sibling are 
Remarkably cordial, plenty of locals commute across the border for work, while Transnistrian companies are increasingly registering or opening branches in Moldova proper. But while there's no fighting and minimal bad blood, that doesn't mean it's all sunshine and rainbows. Yep, it's time we talked about Transnistria's other reputation, that it's a mafia state. So, here's the thing. Despite everyone, including us, playing up the idea that the Soviet Union never ended in Transnistria, that's really only true on the surface. Behind all the communist trappings, the simple fact is that the collapse of the USSR forced Transnistria to evolve, to find sources of income, legitimate or otherwise. For a long time, that meant only one thing. Smuggling. The demise of the Soviet Union left Transnistria home to one of the world's largest ammunition stockpiles. With its Ukrainian border initially porous, that meant the unrecognized statelet could make fast cash with illegal arms deals, arms that could easily be smuggled to Odessa, and from there to the rest of the world. Over time, those involved in smuggling began to expand their operations. By 2014, Transnistria was one of the hubs for those looking to ship everything from counterfeit cigarettes to illegal alcohol to weaponry. It was this that netted the region its reputation as a mafia state, a fake nation controlled by gangsters that only existed to help facilitate law-breaking. Yet while Transnistria certainly had issues with organized crime, the mafia state label isn't really fair anymore. After the 2014 annexation of Crimea, Ukraine suddenly got super jumpy about all the Russian troops still stationed in Transnistria and it massively increased border security. That same year, Moldova signed a trade deal with the EU that eliminated tariffs. In other words, just as one border got sealed to illegal goods, another swung open for legal stuff. And while the trade deal was with Moldova proper, cordial relations between the two meant Transnistria was allowed in on it too. Since these two major shifts, the balance of exports from Transnistria has come down hard on the side of legality. That's not to say the days of contraband or even gun running are over, just that the whole mafia state description is a little behind the times. On the other hand, what you could very much describe Transnistria as is a monopoly. The end of communism opens much of Eastern Europe for the first time to private companies. In Transnistria, though, it was more like private company without the plural. Founded by two ex-KGB agents, the conglomerate Sheriff today owns almost everything in the unrecognized state. It controls gas stations, mobile phone networks, construction work, TV channels, car dealerships, effectively every aspect of commercial life. If you're a football fan, soccer that is, you've probably even witnessed one of the firm's properties in action, FC Sheriff Tiraspol, which entered the Champions League for the first time in 2021, fueled by the crazy amounts of money the conglomerate splurged on them. So. That's Transnistria today then, a still unrecognized microstate that's slowly cleaning up its act, at least somewhat, while remaining in the thrall of an all-powerful monopoly. But there's one question left to answer. What about its future? When we were researching this video, we came across multiple articles that describe Moldova and Transnistria's current relationship as being a model for frozen conflicts. Certainly, movement between the two is relatively easy these days, and there seems to be little overt hostility. Visit Transnistria, and your overwhelming impression will likely be of normalcy, of a calm, functioning place that, Lenin statues aside, could be anywhere in Eastern Europe. That being said, the likelihood of the two ever reunifying, or Transnistria gaining recognition as an independent state is vanishingly small. And it's worth exploring why. Why does it look like this frozen conflict will continue for the foreseeable future? And the answer is as simple as it is predictable. Politics. For all Transnistrians may feel like a distinct culture with a right to national self-determination, the basic reality is that their unrecognized state is seen by most people as a pawn in a much greater game between Russia and the West. That's because Moscow has a Rolodex of similar quasi-states that it supports across the territories of the former USSR, and Western governments believe that this is for nefarious reasons. In Georgia, for example, Russian money helps prop up two breakaway republics, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, the latter of which was the focus of the 2008 Russo-Georgian War. In Ukraine, Moscow also helps keep the self-proclaimed Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics outside of Kiev's control. Nagorno-Karabakh, too, has Russian peacekeepers on the ground, even if that particular conflict went from frozen to super freaking hot very quickly in late 2020. In all these cases, the assumed motive is to keep the larger states they are a part of within Moscow's orbit and away from Western institutions. Thanks to its unresolved border issues with Transnistria, Moldova is unable to join either NATO or the European Union, two institutions Vladimir Putin 
is no great fan of. The continued presence of Russian troops in these places also gives Moscow a handy bit of leverage. Whenever the Kremlin needs to, it can turn up the heat and force everyone to pay attention to any one of these frozen conflicts. Yet while Moscow is keeping Transnistria above water, we shouldn't fall into the trap of thinking that its citizens are just Putin's puppets. As this video has hopefully shown, the reasons why this slither of land running alongside the Nystad wants to be independent are complex, rooted in history and genuinely heartfelt. Life in an unrecognized state can be hard. Lack of recognition brings uncertainty about the future, but it also throws up barriers between you and the rest of the world. Transnistrians find it harder to travel abroad, to study overseas, to even set up financial transactions with the rest of the world. Yet they put up with this because it's clearly important to them. A question not just of living standards, but of something far more important. A sense of identity. In a way, perhaps that is the real most interesting thing about this not-quite-state. Not the Cold War era kitsch, but the fact that its citizens really seem to believe in it as fervently as anyone with a recognized nation to call home. Look, we're just making videos on YouTube. There's no way we can tell you what the future holds for Transnistria, or even how you should really feel about its existence. But the mere fact that it does exist raises all sorts of interesting questions about what makes a state about what it means to live in a nation that no one else believes in. Transnistria may appear to be a Russian-backed time warp in some obscure corner of Europe, but for its 500,000 inhabitants, it's something more than just a click-worthy oddity. It's also home. So I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.